Hello, my name is Ed Chapman, and this video cast is going to cover our sixth benchmark, which is going to be about the flow of energy through ecosystems. Energy flows through ecosystems. It comes in one end and goes out the other, uh, sometimes quite literally. It doesn't recycle, and this is an important thing to remember. Energy flows into ecosystems from the sun. That's the original source of the energy, and the energy comes in, and then it leaves gradually as heat. Uh, it can be something as obvious as the body heat coming off of your body after you digest and burn your food, so to speak. Or it could be a little harder to see, like the, the, the heat leaking out of decomposing vegetation in like a compost pile or something. This energy is passed along through food chains and it doesn't cycle, as I said before. It doesn't move in a loop. Many things in ecosystems do cycle, but energy is not one of them. So, you can visualize it this way. Sunlight is the source of energy. It's solar energy. It passes into the ecosystem where it goes from animal to animal to animal through food chains. And finally, it's going to leave the system as heat. It never goes backwards. You never see food chains or energy flow diagrams looping back on themselves. That's, that's a different process for different things. All right, now the first part of all food chains are going to be the producers. Producers are able to make food from sunlight energy using photosynthesis. So plants are able to take some things in the environment, like carbon dioxide and water, which are absolutely no use to us as food, and force those two molecules together with some energy from the sun to make carbohydrates. And this means that plants are also known as autotrophs. And autotrophs means that they're able to make their own food and then consume the food they've made themselves. And food contains solar energy that's been converted to chemical energy. And chemical energy can be stored. And we measure the stored energy in chemical energy using units called calories. All right, on the other hand, animals are consumers, which means that they must eat food that other animals or plants have produced somewhere else at an earlier point in time. They can't make their own food. So this means they're heterotrophs, and the word hetero comes from, uh, it means different. So heterotrophs or consumers or organisms that have to eat food that was made by a different organism because they can't make it themselves. Food chains connect producers to consumers. So the energy flows from the sun to producers who change that sunlight energy into chemical energy and then a primary consumer or an herbivore will eat the plant and then a secondary consumer will eat the herbivore and then maybe a tertiary consumer will eat the second consumer and so on until finally everything eventually dies and gets decomposed and so whatever energy is left over gets passed to decomposers. Now we can look at this using some pictures. You've got a basic food chain set up here with plants and some animals so let's look at each step and there's a name for each step. Okay, sun, the sun is the original source of the energy. The energy passes to plants, which are called producers. And then the first thing that eats the plants are called the primary consumers. Primary consumers then pass their energy to secondary consumers. And finally, secondary consumers may pass some energy to a tertiary consumer. Uh, most food chains are only three or four steps long, sometimes five or six, but that's rare. And there's a reason for that we're going to talk about a little bit later. So in food chains, the arrows indicate the flow of energy through the ecosystem, from the sun or the, to the producer to the consumers. In ecosystems, though, food chains are a little too simplistic. In nature, we actually have things called food webs. And food webs are interconnected food chains. And here, if we add the arrows, you can see how complicated food webs can get. Um, at the bottom, we have producers. Here, I've labeled them in red for you. Above the producers, we have the primary consumers. And above the primary consumers, we have the tertiary consumers. Uh, primary consumers, because they eat plant material, are also known as herbivores. Secondary consumers, which eat uh, animal material or plant material, um, can be called omnivores or carnivores, depending what they eat. If they eat only meat, we call them carnivores. If they eat a mixture of plant and animal material, we call them omnivores. Humans have to be, happen to be omnivores. And in this food web, we have one tertiary consumer, the fox, because the fox can eat animals that ate animals, that ate producers. So foxes are at the third level. Um, I don't think there's anything else in this food web that gets to the tertiary level. 
Decomposers are organisms, we also know them as fungi and bacteria, that break down dead material and convert it back into carbon dioxide and water, and in the process releasing some heat. So everything in this food web that will eventually die produce dead material, which will then of course be decomposed. That looks like I forgot to put an arrow on the fruits. Sorry about that. The fruits also decompose. Um, here are some decomposing strawberries. Looks pretty nasty. But the organism you see consuming the energy in these strawberries is a mold, which is a kind of fungus, a very common decomposer in ecosystems. Now, another way to understand food webs is using something called energy pyramids, or another way of calling them trophic level pyramids. And trophic level pyramids have a shape. They're pointy at the top and they're wide at the base, just like a real pyramid is. And trophic level pyramids are very simple to set up. You just put the producers at the bottom, and above them you place the consumers. And the arrows here I've added in just for clarity to show you how the energy is passing up from the bottom towards the top until finally it gets all the way to the top. And as you can see, as you move closer to the top, there's less and less volume in the pyramid, or less and less area in this triangle. And there's a reason for that. It's the 10% rule. Each time energy flows up from one level of the pyramid to the next, about 90% of it is lost and only about 10% of it gets passed on. Um, the 90% that isn't passed up is used to keep the animals alive, to grow and move and do all those things. But only about 10% of it gets passed up to the next level and converted to the weight or the body weight or the biomass of the organisms at the next level. Easy way to see this is if we actually use some numbers. So imagine we have a thousand kilograms of a producer, let's say corn plants, and we're going to feed that corn to some primary consumers, let's say chickens. All right. According to the 10% rule, we're only going to be able to get about a hundred kilograms of chicken meat from that thousand kilograms of corn. Only we get we only get to keep 10%, and so on. If we continue it up, you can see by the time you get to the top of the pyramid to the apex predator, or to the, the final predator at the top of the, the pyramid, uh, only a very small fraction of the original energy in the ecosystem is made at that high. All right, we'll stop there and pick up in the next podcast with Benchmark 7.